You guys, I'm so excited to be at my church. I love that. And my favorite time of year is Christmas, so I'm really excited about kicking off a Christmas series because this is my jam all over it, right? So I want to tell you a story. Before my husband and I moved to Las Vegas, I worked at Spring Arbor University in Michigan. And uh, one year, one of my students was getting ready to go home for Christmas break. And it was the first time that he had gone back home since he came to school in that fall. And I passed him outside, and I'm like, dude, you don't look good. What's going on? And he said, I do not want to go home. He said, I, I am not excited about going home for break. And I'm like, who is not excited about a break from school? Like, there's something wrong with you. And he said, no, you don't understand. Everything in my life has changed. And when I go home, I have to step into it. I have to step into the change. And I don't do well with change, and I'm not excited. And I said, do you want to talk about that? And he said, no, I'll talk to you when I get back. So he left. He went home. I went about my business. Two weeks later, school resumed. And I saw him again, and I'm like, James, how was it when you went home? And he said, as long as I was inside my house, everything was fine. But when I stepped outside, everything was different. And I'm like, that makes no sense to me. You're going to have to give me a little more details because I don't know what you're saying. And he said, you see, when I came to school in the fall, my, my family moved. And it was my first time going home since my family moved. So I went home, and it was a new neighborhood. It was a new city. It was a new yard. But when I was in my house, everything was the same, and I was fine. Everything looked normal when I was in my house. But when I went outside, everything was different. And I'm like, everything looked normal in your house? Like you had a new house. And he's like, no, I didn't. My family moved my house. And I'm like, they do, you can do that? And they literally jacked up his house, put it on a truck, and drove it 90 miles north and plopped it in a new land. And he had same house, new city. Same house, new grass. Same house, new neighbors. And he's like, it was weird. Like, it, it looked normal. It looked okay, but nothing was okay. On the inside, nothing was okay. It just looked okay, appearance-wise. And I'm like, you probably need to tell me a little bit more about that. Like, what, what is going on there? And he said the craziest thing is when he was sitting at his kitchen table in the kitchen looking out the window. This is the table that he sat at every single morning for his entire 19 years of his life and ate breakfast and looked out the same window he has looked out every year for 19 years. And all of a sudden he realized, as I look around the kitchen, everything appears okay. But when I look out the window, nothing is right. Because he realized he was facing the wrong direction. Because when he grew up and he sat at his kitchen table and looked out the window, he was facing north. But now, when he sat at his kitchen table and looked out the window, he was facing east. And he said, everything shifted. And I'm like, there is such truth in those words. Everything can look okay and look normal in our life, but if we are not facing in the right direction, everything shifts. And that's what happened. His perspective went from true north to er, over here. And do you know what happens when our perspective shifts? Our eyes shift because we follow our perspective. And if I'm looking in this direction, I'm going to move in this direction because our movement and our action and our behavior follows our eyes. If our eyes are not focused on true north, we're walking in the wrong direction. And that's what he found. Everything was crazy. Christmas is a time for us to shift to true north because we get skewed throughout the year. We get shifted just slightly, and our eyes are off focus, and we're moving in the wrong direction. You've all heard and been and seen Christmas plays, right? We start to tell the Christmas story, and we immediately think of all these Christmas plays that we've grown up watching and you know, seeing on TV or seeing in church. And, and you know what they look like? It's Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem. Mary's riding on a... Joseph is walking next to her, right? They're going to Bethlehem. They're knocking on all the doors. There's no room. They're being told they have to keep going. They got to keep moving. Mary is very pregnant. The baby's about to be born. And what are we filled with as we watch the movie? Anxiety. It's like, 
oh, she's going to have the baby. What are we going to do, right? Like, that's the way we tell the story. It's the way that we interpret the story. It kind of creates panic in us. That's what happens. Mary finally comes down off the donkey because the baby's going to be born, and they find a stable or a barn, or some say a cave, and they go in, and shazam! Mary gives birth to the baby Jesus and lays him in the manger. Ta-da! We've all seen the Charlie Brown Christmas, right? That's how it happens. We all know that. Can I just give you a side note? There is no way, no way that story is accurate because all the women in the room, what baby, firstborn, male, comes like that at the drop of a hat? Like that just doesn't happen. That's not the way babies are birthed, right? We know that can't possibly be true. So Mary, in the story, gives birth to Jesus, and places Jesus in the manger, right? That's the story. Story continues. We've seen it. A little kid shows up dressed like a cow. There's a kid dressed up like a sheep. There's a kid dressed up like a donkey. There's two little blonde-haired girls, angels, singing their song in the chorus, right? A couple of shepherds come into the stable, into the barn, and kneel at the manger. And then here's how we know it can't be true. Three hellion little boys who are in middle school come walking in dressed like wise men and have packages for the king. That is the Christmas story. Isn't it cute? It makes for a really cute Christmas play. But what happens when that story is our lens? of the birth of Jesus, and we start to interpret God through the lens of that story. And all of a sudden, we put all this stuff onto God that really isn't true, that's really not there. Ken Bailey is a historian who is, uh, devoted his life to studying culture and history in the times of Jesus, and he says this, the more familiar we are with a biblical story, the more difficult it is to view it outside of the way it has always been understood. That lens, that tradition that has been passed down to us subconsciously informs how we read the narrative of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. We read it picturing these images of the stories that we have been told through generations. And do you know what else it does? It takes Jesus and it puts him in a box because Jesus fits the narrative of our story. And it takes that box and it puts it way over there. Not here where I am. Jesus is over here in the barn. He's out in the stable. He's not here where I am. Jesus is outside. He's not inside. He's not in my heart. He's in a box. He's not in my life. And that's how we view our life because of the lessons that we have learned. The story is actually told that way with elements of truth because in AD 200, a novel was written by an anonymous man who told the Christmas narrative that way using all kinds of figurative speech and imaginative details about the characters in the Bible, the position in the Bible, the location, how the story was told, and it has been just passed down through generation after generation after generation, and that's how we interpret it. In the narrative, in the novel, Mary says to Joseph, Joseph, take me down from the donkey because the baby presses forth to come. So responding to that request, Joseph takes Mary off the donkey, puts her in a cave, and goes into Bethlehem to find a midwife, and by the time he comes back, the baby is born, and there's a bright light shining down on the cave. Can you picture it? Of course we can, because it's how we were told the story. It's how we learned the story of Jesus. Through a novel that was written in AD 200, it's how it was passed down. Now, I want you to stop panicking, because I'm not talking hearsay. I'm not saying we're throwing out the birth of Jesus. Absolutely not. It's absolutely true, the birth of Jesus. What I'm saying is, we have to read Luke chapter 2, the narrative of the story of Jesus, with the details that are in Luke chapter 2, not the details that are in the Charlie Brown Christmas story. Because that's the truth, Luke chapter 2. 
So we're going to read it this morning, and then we're going to unpack it. So this is Luke chapter 2, the story of the birth of Jesus. So Joseph, oh, let's start there. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. That is the true story of the birth of Jesus. That's the true story. What's the difference? The difference between Luke chapter 2 in the gospel and the Christmas plays that have been passed down through years of tradition is the position of the manger. That's the difference. Because the position of the manger literally changes everything. Changes the whole story. When we read the story from the first perspective, from the novel perspective, we read it with a sense of chaos and a sense of urgency and a sense of desperation, a sense of Joseph and Mary not being cared for, a sense of them having to travel all this way while Mary's pregnant because she was just hours away from giving birth. And it raises natural questions with us. And you know what the first natural question is? Where is God? We find ourselves facing hard stuff, and we say, where is God? Well, where do you think that came from? We've been taught that, right? It raises a question, what's wrong with all those people? Who would do that to her? Why would that happen? There's no God in that. What's wrong with Joseph? Who would treat his fiance that way? Like, where's the love? It's missing, right? They arrive in Bethlehem, they go door to door to door, and they're turned away. And we read and we feel dejection, depression, desperation. People are awful. People are not good. People don't treat others well. We read all of that. Jesus is born in a barn, and we think that's all he was worthy of, is being born in a barn. Right? It impacts the way that we see and the way that we interpret and the way that we live our life because it shifts our perspective. And all the way through, we're asking the question, where's God in this story? Why is that happening? Why is it happening the way that it's happening? That's too hard. Where's God? Right? Jesus is put in the manger out in the barn along with the animals, and we can smell it. We can smell the manure. We can feel the straw. Right? He's isolated. He's alone. We feel isolated, and we feel alone. What's the question? Where's God? Why am I in this? thought God was my protector. I thought God was my provider. This is hard. Where's God? Right? The shepherds come and go to the stable because they can't go into the house. They're not worthy enough to go into the house. they got to go in the barn. And we feel that. We interpret our life that way. 
that view subconsciously informs how we do our life. We don't even realize it, and that's, but that's how we're looking at our life. But if we set the scene from the details of Luke chapter 2, we have the opportunity to take our perspective and shift it back to true north and say, what's really happening here in my world? What's really happening here in my life? And in order to do that, we have to look at a few backstory things before we crack open and dig into Luke chapter 2. The first thing we have to look at is who wrote the book, right? Who wrote down Luke chapter 2? Well, Luke is written by Luke. That, that's an easy one for us, right? Luke is the guy who wrote down the book of Luke. And what do we know about him? We know that he's a doctor. We know that he's educated. We know that Luke is the only Gentile author in the, first, in the New Testament. Every other book is written by a Jewish man. Luke is written by Luke, a Gentile. It's written in Greek. It's Luke's language. He's educated. He knows what he's writing. There's a verse at the beginning of Luke that tells us exactly what we need to know about Luke, and this is it. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I also have decided to write an account accurate for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Luke paid attention to the details. So the details in Luke chapter 2 are the details we need to know to have a plumb line for our life because that's who Luke was. So there's another thing that helps us understanding the book of Luke, and that's history, right? In a Palestinian home during the time of the birth of Jesus, it would look much like this. So I want you to get this picture in your mind. It was a single-story, two-room house. That's what the Palestinian homes looked like. Deborah, I know I saw you earlier. You could sell this home, my friend, because this home was the first open-floor concept ever in homes. It's right here. So a Palestinian home had a courtyard, sometimes called a stable, but it was a courtyard, under the roof of the home, three steps up, one big floor divided in half, not in half, but divided into two by a wall. They had a family living room and a guest room. The guest room, the Greek word for guest room, is kataluma. Kataluma means guest room. Kataluma is the word that Luke uses in chapter 2 when he says there was no room for them in the cataluma, in the guest room. That's where there was no room. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. The family room is crucial to understand. Everything for the family happened in the family room. They cooked there. They prepared all their meals there. They ate there, they gathered there, they played bunko there, that's where they had their Super Bowl parties, and they all slept there. Everything for the family happened in the family room. It truly was the living room. The guest room was exclusive for guests, never used by anyone but a guest. The Cataluma was the guest room. Remember, Luke is written by Luke, a Gentile author who knew the Greek language, and he chose the word Cataluma because he paid attention to accurate details. He used Cataluma because it was the guest room in the home. There's another word that Luke uses uh, later that describes a different type of room, but Luke also uses the word Cataluma in Luke 22, where he tells the story of Jesus saying to the disciples to go into the city and follow the man who's carrying a jar of water into his house and say to him, uh, the teacher asks, where is your guest room, the Cataluma, because we want to come and have Passover there. And the man says it's here and takes them there and it's the upper room of their home, Cataluma. 
when the Bible was translated into English, they took the word Cataluma and translated it to in, in English. When we hear the word in, we think of Motel 6. But that's not what it means in the original language. It's not what it means in the historical time of Bethlehem. Cataluma is the guest room of your home. That's what the word means. Luke tells us that Jesus was placed in the manger because the guest room was already full. The guest room would have been the room in their house. We're going to come back to the manger in just a minute, but let's dig into this Cataluma just a little bit more. Hospitality was hugely important in this culture, hugely. Every single home was built with a guest room because there was an expectation that your home was always available for guests. You always would open your door to a guest. You had to provide for guests. That was the culture. Every home had a Cataluma. If you were rich, you might build a second floor on your home, and the entire second floor is your Cataluma. They prepared, they planned for guests. It was part of their culture. So get the picture. This is what Mary and Joseph would have found when they arrived in Bethlehem. They would have gone to their family home, and the guest room of their family home was full. So where would they have been placed? In the family room, with the family. Not out in the barn, not in a box out back. They would have been welcomed in to the family room. It's the culture. It's what they did. That's the image that we need to have in our mind when we tell the Christmas story. It is the image of God putting on flesh and coming to earth and coming right into the center of our lives and saying, you have a seat in my family room. You don't belong out in the barn. You don't belong in a box. You belong in the family room. Welcome to the family of God. That is the Christmas story of Luke chapter 2. And that's the story that we have been invited into. We get to be a part of that. That's what Mary and Joseph found. They weren't walking down the Las Vegas Strip seeing no vacancy signs flashing on all of the banners. They were welcomed in. Welcome home. Welcome to the family. You've got a place in the family room. You belong here. That's the image that we need to have. That will shift our perspective of how we go through life when we have that image. We know this is true because in Luke 10, when Luke is telling the story of the Good Samaritan, he uses the word pandohean when he's talking about the inn. Pandohean is a commercial inn. Luke, a Greek writer writing in his language, who did all the research to make sure we had all the accurate details, does not say Jesus was born because there was no vacancy in a commercial inn, but Jesus was born in the family room because the guest room was full. We got to understand that it impacts our life. Where we put the manger impacts our life. It impacts how we go through life. I love that Jesus wasn't pushed to the barn, wasn't shoved outside, but he was welcomed in. There's some other facts that we know that tell us that that's, that's true. And this is it. When we go back to that story of Luke chapter 2, what do we know? We have to ask the question, why are they going to Bethlehem in the first place, right? Why are they even going there? Well, it tells us that they have to go there because Caesar Augustus issued a decree that everyone has to go back to their city of origin because he's taking this census. This census. Joseph is a descendant of David. Not just David, King David. All right, get the image. Joseph is royalty, people. Joseph is a family line of King David. There's no way Joseph was put out in the barn. He's royalty going to the city of David. Every single door in the city would have been open to him. He's royalty. He was welcomed in to his family home. There's no doubt about it. He wasn't pushed out to the outside. We have to just stop right there and camp on that for a minute. Royalty bringing forth the Son of God, welcomed in to the family. 
That's the image that we need to have. Historical memories were so long that all Joseph would have needed to say is, I am Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathath, the son of Levi. And every door in the town would have been open to him. There's no way he was pushed out to the barn. They would not have done that. If they would have done that, it would have brought shame on the entire town because the royalty was turned away. Imagine Prince William knocking on your door. What are you going to do? Dude, come on in. I just want to hear your accent, right? Like You're going to welcome him in. That's the image that we have because it's royalty. And what about Mary? She's about to give birth, right? Right? So every woman who is about to give birth is given special attention in that culture. There's no way she was turned away. They would not have done that. That does not fit with the culture and the history that we know to be true. And she was engaged to royalty. She would have been welcomed in. She would not have been turned away. Mary also had close family living by. Just three months prior, she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, in the hill country of Judea. Bethlehem is located in Judea, surrounded by the hill country. Three months earlier, Mary went, and Elizabeth welcomed her into her home. And we know that Elizabeth knew that she was pregnant, because what did the baby in Elizabeth's womb do when Mary stepped into the house? Leapt for joy, right? They didn't shun her. They welcomed her in. It does not even stand to reason that three months later, they would have shunned her and not given her a place to stay. It doesn't fit doesn't fit with the narrative, right? The details in scripture are the details that we need to pay attention to. So they weren't in a stable out back. They were in a family room, not not over in a barn, but in the guest room. So why then would Jesus be placed in a manger? We have to unpack that for a minute. So that open space, when we had that picture of the home in between the courtyard and the family room, was just like a pony wall wide open into here, like three feet tall with these three steps. When the families built their homes, they put right there on that pony wall a manger or two because the foyer, the courtyard, is where in the evenings the family would bring their animals in for safety and for protection into their home, into the courtyard with an open wall where the animals could go to the manger and eat at will. So they had what they needed. So the manger is actually in the house, not out in the barn. And here's the most amazing thing. The manger was so crucial to the livelihood of the family that often when they were building the home, they placed the manger right down into the foundation of the home, and then they built the home up around the manger. Where is Jesus supposed to be born? and the foundation of our lives, not in a box out in the barn. That's not where he belongs. He belongs as our foundation. And that's the image of Luke chapter 2. That's the Jesus that we serve. The manger is inside the home. It's the center of the home. It's our foundation. Y'all, what we do with the manger matters. It matters in our life. The position of the manger matters. Where we put Jesus in our narrative matters. What we do with him changes everything, right? When we move Jesus from the stable to the house, from the outside to the inside, from the peripheral of our life to the center, everything shifts. Everything shifts. The way we look at our world shifts The way that we see God shifts. The way we see our circumstances shifts. We look out our kitchen window and all of a sudden we are once again looking true north because we have positioned the manger correctly. We've positioned Jesus correctly in our life. And it changes our perspective. Our perspective of Mary when we position the manger correctly shifts. How we look at her life shifts. Mary was loved so deeply, so greatly, that she wasn't put in the barn. She was brought into the family room. Our position of God, our perspective of God shifts. God loved Mary so much 
that not only did he put her in the family room, he actually went before her to make sure that other guests arrived first so the guest room would be full so that Mary could be put in the family room. That is the God that we serve, the God who so goes before us that he changes the circumstances so we step into what God has for us, his very best. That's the God we serve. That's the perspective that we have when we've got the manger positioned correctly in our life, when it's in the right place. We see God as our protector. We see God as our provider. We see God as the one who goes before us. That's the entry of God into the world with flesh on for you and for me. God enters the world and says, I love you this much. I care for you this much. I will go before you this much. So you have a place in my family room. That's our God. That's who we serve. When we look back into the story of Mary's life with that properly positioned manger, we see the hand of God in her past. We see the hand of God on her life, right? Same thing happens for us. When we have the manger positioned correctly in our life, we can look back on our past and see the hand of God correctly. We can see what, he's, what, he's, what he did. We can see like why that happened the way that it happened. Because the past has the hand of God on it in our life, when the manger is positioned correctly. Where we position the manger today determines how we're going to look at our life, right? Not only in our past, but also in our present. If we don't have the manger positioned correctly, we're not looking at our life circumstances correctly today. We have to have the manger positioned correctly in order to see life correctly, because it really makes a difference. For the present, for Mary, when the, when the manger was positioned correctly, she didn't go through her present life with shame. She went through her present life protected from shame. She had the right perspective. When Mary went to her cousin Elizabeth and knocked on the door and Elizabeth welcomed her in, Elizabeth did that because Elizabeth had the right perspective of the Messiah in her life. That enabled Elizabeth to open the door to Mary. That's what happens to us too. When we have the manger positioned correctly in the present, we don't go through life with shame. We go through life released from shame because we know who Jesus is and what he's done for us, right? And he didn't come to put shame on us, but to take shame off. And we can do that when we have that manger positioned correctly in our life. That's what happens. We can't always see what God is up to in our life today. We can't. We don't always... It's not always clear, right? We go through stuff that is hard. That is just real life. There are things that happen that are confusing. There are things that happen that don't make sense. But if we can put the position of Jesus in our life in the center, then we're positioned to go through those things very differently than if we don't have him in the center of our life, right? Hard stuff happens. My mom has cancer. That's hard. Some of you may have cancer. That's hard. People lose their jobs. That's hard. People lose their homes. That's hard. Relationships struggle. That's hard. Friends hurt us sometimes. That's hard. Sometimes our businesses fail. That's hard. But if we don't have Jesus in the center, we will go through those things asking, where's God? Why did God remove his hand from me? God isn't faithful. God doesn't do what he says. God's not being right for me. But if we put the manger in the center, if Jesus is in the center, we go through the exact same circumstance and we say, I may not see it, but I don't have to see it to know that God is God. I don't have to feel it to know that God is faithful. And today, in this difficult thing, I am going to stand on the character of God because I know the character of God is true. I know that God will show up because he's always shown up in the past and he's always done what he said. If he did it for Mary, he will do it for me. That's the way we face those hard times. And we walk through the uncertainty knowing that this may be uncertain, but God isn't. God is certain. And we trust his hand. And we can walk through it. If we put Jesus in a box out in the garage on a shelf, we don't get to go through it like that. We can't. We don't have the ability to walk through it that way. But when Jesus is in the center, everything shifts, and we go through God very differently when we position him correctly. We live in some really crazy times. That's true, right? 
there's unrest in Israel, that's crazy. Our economy feels like it could crash at any minute and it could take us all out. We're facing a presidential election that honestly, it doesn't matter who wins the election, everybody loses. Like that's just what it feels like, right? It's where we're at. Our children's identity is on the chopping block every day. It's just so uncertain. We live in a world where a shooter at UNLV can decide to take people out. It is the world that we live in and we can face that future with a crazy perspective if we don't have Jesus in the center. But when we shift and put Jesus back in the center where he belongs, then we can step into the crazy with the confidence of God, the confidence of who God is. He will protect us and carry us through our future because that's who he is. It's what he says he will do, and he always does what he says he will do. And that's what we need to do is place that manger correctly. What happens when we do that is we go from having a secular worldview to having a biblical worldview. The biblical worldview says God's in control. It may look like chaos, but it's order to him because he's in control. A biblical worldview says Jesus is my center and I'm going to rest in that. I'm going to confidently rest with Jesus as my center. You know what the results are of placing Jesus in the center? Christmas gifts for everyone. That's the result. We have peace. We have joy. We have faith. We have love. We have patience. We have gentleness. We have goodness. We have meekness. We have self-control. Because we know that God is in control. Because he's our center. And we focus our eyes there. So we face true north and we walk in that direction. That's the result of putting the manger in the right position. So here's the question that we have to answer. Where have you put the manger? Where is Jesus in your life today? Is he in a box out in the garage and you only pull him out when you need him or when you want to decorate your home or when you want to put on your Sunday best? Or is he in the center of your home, the center of your life, the foundation of who you are? and you're walking out with him, what you do with Jesus today matters. What are you going to do with him? That's the question. That is our essential question. What are you going to do with Jesus? There's something that I'd like you to do that could help you with making Jesus be your center, and it is our essential challenge for this week. And this is it. Every morning for the next seven days, when you wake up in the morning before your feet hit the bed, say this, this prayer, Jesus, be the center of my life. And then every night before you go to bed, just review your day and ask God to show you, God, how did I live my life today with evidence that you are my center? And how did I live my life today with evidence that you're not? Help me, God, in those areas to make you be my center. Because... That's the perspective that we want to have in our life, that Jesus is our center, right? I want to give you the opportunity this morning. You may not have ever asked Jesus to be the center of your life. And when I say Christmas gifts for everyone, I'm telling you that is the best Christmas gift anyone could give you, is the gift of Jesus as your Savior, Jesus as your center. And so we don't want to let that go without giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the center of your life. And so if that is you, we're going to pray a prayer in a minute, and I would invite you just to repeat that prayer with me, and we're all going to say it together. Um, but, but make today your day. Make this Christmas season the season that Jesus becomes your center. And to those of you who maybe did that a long time ago, but your perspective has just shifted a little bit, and your kitchen window is now looking east instead of north, would you just make today the day that you say, Jesus, shift me back. Shift me back to you being my true north, you being my center, because that will shift your life. It will shift your world because Jesus is where he belongs in your heart. So would you stand with me, please, and uh, just repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I need you to be the center of my life. I need your forgiveness of my sins. Forgive me for taking control 
Forgive me for putting you in a box and for putting myself in the center. I invite you to be rightfully placed in the center of my life, the center of my home, the center of me. Turn my eyes to you, Jesus, for you are my savior. I am redeemed by you. I am your child. You are my center. Amen.